I saw an interesting meme this past week. Uh, speaking of John 3.16, the most popular New Testament passage in the world. Um, Jesus' last words, verse 17, are the most important. And the meme went like this. If God did not send the Son into the world to condemn it, I doubt God sent you to do it. <laughs> Little thought. <laughs> Think about it. Uh, no, today is this marvelous Holy Trinity celebration the uh, world over. And we are speaking of a divine and yet a very down-to-earth mystery. And a mystery is something that you can't fully understand. But I want to say this about the Holy Trinity. I think there are two ditches we need to avoid as Christians when it comes to speaking about the Holy Trinity. Number one, the ditch of saying too much. Um, we don't know everything about God. Let's not pretend that we do. And some people do. They go on and on again, on again talking about things they know nothing of, but it suits their human needs. Oh, God is the one who is blessing me with this and that and the other thing. Um, how do you know it just didn't happen? Okay, maybe. Um, God is bringing me health, wealth, and success because I'm a really good person. Baloney. Don't say things that the gospel has no interest in whatsoever. And that's one of them. And by the way, it's huge in our culture. No, I think that we say too many things, including preachers. Um, we should keep it to a minimum with humility. But this is the other ditch. Not to say enough. There's two ditches. One is you say too much and cloud up everything with confusion. The other thing is you don't give yourself the chance to share what's most important about God for Christians, God's abiding, everlasting, outrageous, unconditional love. That's what should be said with confidence because we get that message from the second person of the Trinity himself, Jesus the Christ. Now, um, I'm admittedly, I've been accused of, and rightly so, being a second article Trinitarian. <laughs> you know, remember the, you remember the creed, the first article, God the creator, second article, God the redeemer, and Jesus. Third article, God the Holy Spirit. I talk about Jesus a lot. I don't apologize for it, by the way. Uh, call me a second article Christian. That's all right. It could be worse names. I've been called worse names. Um, but we do want to keep together this marvelous mystery of the Holy Trinity, which theologians have used a Greek word for, parachoresis. Para is a round, choresis is a dance. The Holy Trinity is a dance of love between the mother or father, the son, the brother, and the Holy Spirit, the advocate. And by the way, use many names for God. It's all right. It's good. Uh, the Bible uses many names, hundreds. Yeah, we can do it. I don't say we need to throw out the one historic Catholic and apostolic creed. That would be unwise. That's our history. Don't throw it out. I don't. But at the same time, we're a reforming church. What does that mean? And the creed was uh, initial creed, the Roman creed in the second century became the apostles, and they lived in patriarchy. So they used that. All right. Give them a bone. That's how they lived. And we live in a different time. We can use other words. Remember the last few Sundays, St. John the Elder? He's always using one word. God is what? Love. God is love. Jesus said God is spirit. Those who worship God worship God in spirit. Jesus is called, uh, God calls the Father the light, the rock. There's all kinds of names. Don't be afraid to explore. You have a right to explore. Uh, you're going to sing this, but I'm going to give you a prelude to it. I love our hymn of the day, as I always do. Well, listen to this. Mother, brother, holy partner, Father, spirit, only son, we would praise your name forever, one in three and three in one. We would share your life and passion, share your word, of world made new 
ever singing, ever praising, one with all and one with you. And there's four poignant, evocative verses. And get ready for it and love it. It's fun. Womb of life is used for the creator. Isn't that a marvelous understanding of creation? Brooding spirit. I love it, as St. Augustine said in his <laughs> daring uh, exegesis of Genesis chapter 1, the creation of the world. He said, the Holy Trinity was up there having a party. They loved each other. They loved to listen to each other. And they thought, why should we have all this love and this dance to ourselves? Let us create a world, a creation that we will love just like we love each other. And he said the Holy Spirit started brooding over <laughs> brooding over the uh, idea. And then she loved it. And the Father said, Jesus, you'll be the agent through which I will create. Is everybody on board? I mean, I'm cutting to the chase here. But Augustine, I, I love what he did. You can have some freedom. I mean, you, you, you can't use anything for God. I mean, come on, you know, it's got to be appropriate. <laughs> but there's all kinds of ways we can and should think about God, but remembering all the time that we'll never fully understand. But there is one thing we can understand, and it's in the middle of the magic drawing board, the mola mola fish. Um, sometime in, uh, it must have been in, uh, about, oh, maybe 10 years ago, Becky and I went down to Monterey, California, and actually we went down there twice. Our daughter and son-in-law were living there. He was at the Presidio. And you know where we went? The Monterey Aquarium. How many have been there? Oh my gosh, you know what I'm talking about. It's this splendid, uh, awesome series of huge tanks, 30 feet long and 15 feet high, some of them, filled with creatures uh, like this, <laughs> even stranger. <laughs> um, there's some strange things in there, and kelp and all this kind of stuff. Okay, and what we, we spent an entire day, because you can't see it all. You could be there a week and not see it all. Now, I want you to imagine, as beautifully as the kids do, that uh, this is a picture of God. And what do you see when you look into the aquarium? What do you see when we look towards our understanding of God? Lots of things. The Bible has many different ideas about God. And let's remember, it's a human book inspired by the Spirit, and it's a product of its culture. So you have some things that are not at all in line with the gospel in the Bible about God. And you have some things that are real surprises in the Bible about God. What do we do with this plethora of things? There is one creature that we saw over and over again that we couldn't wait to see. Because we're looking, you know, at this tank. Oh, and the sardines. I'd never seen billions of sardines swimming quickly by so quickly you really couldn't even see their eyes but it was gorgeous and we saw octopus and we saw a shark or 50 of them uh, I mean it's huge uh, and then you saw all this vegetation and fish and creatures would dart in and out of the vegetation you'd see it for a second but you couldn't finish it well, what was that color Becky what was the color of that tail I don't know it went too fast what was the color of those eyes, Michael? Dad, it went, it was too fast. I couldn't see it all. Would well, do you have an idea? I have a little idea. That's us and God, see? We get glimpses of what God is like. We don't get a full picture. The Bible's not a data bank. It's our faith stories. Very many and very different faith stories. And out of each faith story, we can gain a little knowledge of what God is like, but we never have the complete one. And we're promised that someday in the future we'll have the complete one. Be patient now. But, <laughs> just remember this, when the mola mola fish came in, by the way, it's 14 feet tall and 10 feet wide. It's, I tried to make it look like that. Uh, it's very strange. But here's the thing. It was slow enough, gentle enough, that you could actually see it in its entirety. 
It would turn nicely for us to see the back fin. It would go upside down, that mouth. Blah, 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 blah. We loved it. And then a shark would come by or something, set the whole thing, and he'd slowly move away and then get lost in the kelp and then come back again. And it was, we waited for it because there's one aspect of the aquarium and of the ocean, what they're trying to do is show you what the ocean looks like, that we knew we could count on. And you know who the mole of all the fish is in my illustration? Jesus, the Christ. The clearest example we have of God, Luther said, and others, is Jesus the Christ, who is God in the flesh, who came here, who talked with people, who embraced them, who cried with them, who laughed with them, who healed them. And this is our the Christian picture of who God really is above all the other creatures in the aquarium, above all the other ideas, we have a God who is not ashamed to love God's creation and to enter it. And this is the only faith that does. And I'm not putting down others. We get lots of insights from Hindus and Muslims and so forth. But as Christians, yes, we have one clearest picture of God that you can count on above all others. And that's Jesus Christ's love. God's love coming to us right down to earth where we live. How does it work with congregations? A few years ago uh, in Minneapolis, uh, there was an installation of the Reverend Canon Peg Chamberlain. She was a Moravian pastor Marvelous. I love her. I miss her. So full of insight. She was elected to be the president of the Minnesota Council of Churches, which was a gathering of heads of communion trying to live out the Holy Trinity's proclamation to us. Did you know that the the Father, Son, and Spirit, the Mother, Brother, and Advocate have joined us to their work? Yes. It's all over in the New Testament. Uh, The Christian faith does not simply say there's this trinity up there transcendent somewhere that we'll never see and we're just just trying to figure it out. The Christian faith says the Holy Trinity has come to live, as Jesus said, the mola mola fish, right among us. Oh, maybe you haven't heard some of these verses. I got them here. Got to find them. Here they are. I have these pictures of the Holy Trinity that you might never have seen before. The Native American Christian Holy Trinity is beautiful. The uh, the creator could be male or female. Jesus is native. The spirit is an eagle. Uh, Thanks to Phil Waite, who during our Bible study last week shared with us a beautiful icon of God the Father along with Jesus on the cross which is a huge picture of what God is really like. Loving us so much is willing to suffer with us. It was God on the cross, the New Testament says. That's what God is like. Not only loving us, but willing to suffer with us. See, um, and Phil Waite brought this picture and, and, and sent it to us, and uh, I've got it somewhere if you want to talk to me about it. Um, But Jesus said some words that were very, very important. And uh, here he says it. Do you not believe, this is in the Gospel of John, same Gospel we're in, a few chapters later, that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? This is the dance, see? The dance around each other, the dance of love. It gets better. Uh, the words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does the work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. Did you know you participate in the Holy Trinity? You do. Uh, you know, we, we don't often remember that, but for the body of Christ, it's not just believing in the Trinity, you know, accepting you know, some theoretical idea of God. It's God has come to dwell within us. I will ask the Father, Jesus says later in John, uh, 
and he will come and make his home in you, and I in him, and you in me. And, and, it, and it's grammatically, it's crazy, but it's, it's beautiful. I and the Father, the Father and me, me and you, you and me. You see that? It's relational. Um, I think that there's a danger in thinking that Christianity is only about understanding God. Uh, it's good. Augustine said, faith seeks understanding. We want to know more. Some people want to not just know more, but lord it over others. And the other side of it is relational. Uh, would you rather be right or in a relationship with God? Be careful with that one because you're never going to be fully right. So you better go with the second one. <laughs> and that's what God wants. Oh, do, I think God may smile that we figure out a few things, a few. But God really laughs and is filled with joy and embraces it when we recognize that Christianity is about a relationship first, final, even after this world. Okay, so we're in this, uh, I started telling you a story about <clears throat> Reverend Canon Peg Chamberlain. Um, she was Moravian, and the Minnesota Council of Churches is a group of all kinds of Christians, denominations, Reformed, Lutheran, Episcopal, Catholic, uh, UCC, uh, I'm missing some, Presbyterians, there's a bunch. And we were all gathered there to celebrate her installation. And we gathered at Hennepin Avenue Methodist Church, downtown Minneapolis, with this tall spire you can see for miles on 94 and 394 and all this. There were hundreds of people gathered, and there were about, oh, 30 heads of communion, bishops and heads of communion. And the poor soul who had to, you know, gather us together, <laughs> because we're all yapping, you know, clergy, they're all yapping all the time. And she tried to gather us. She finally had to yell, quiet! Get your vestments on and be quiet. I'm going to show you where we're going to go. It's a long ways. I mean, Hennepin Avenue Methodist is really a gorgeous building. But it was so old, there's no elevator, although they're getting one. And there's all these winding hallways and very narrow winding staircases. And I thought, how long a journey is this? We kept talking and walking together. She kept trying to keep us together. And she said, now when we get toward the sanctuary, I want you all to be quiet. You know? Well, halfway through, we did become quiet. You know why? Suddenly, out of nowhere, we heard the faint noise of many dogs barking. And at first, I thought it was downtown, you know, right a couple blocks away or something. The more we got toward the middle of the room on the second floor with its great big glass doors, the louder the dogs got. They were in the church. I thought, what are dogs? And of course, everyone's imagining now what's really going on, like we imagine about God. Oh, it must be this, it must be that. We finally got to the uh, doors and we saw, indeed, there were about three dozen dogs in various positions on tables with veterinarians with needles and pills and bandages. And then there were cats too, but they were quieter. <laughs> and next to all of this were the people who owned the dogs. And you know who they were? The homeless people downtown Minneapolis. Why? Because the Hennepin Avenue Methodist Church said, we take our cue from 2 Corinthians 5. And I know you all have it memorized. 2 Corinthians 5 is this very thing about the divine dance of the Trinity inviting us into partnership with reconciliation for the world. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to God's self. And we are now reconcilers with God to the cosmos. And they said, that means, cosmos means cosmos. It means the world. It means the dogs too. <laughs> and it means the poor homeless who, whose only friend, by the way, is often a dog. And here they were treating these on the day of this important liturgical thing with all these heads of communion. That didn't make any difference to them. They're going to do what God wants, see? God was in Christ, reconciling the world, and through the Spirit has strengthened you to live God's dream to the world. It's a marvelous, abundant life. That's what Jesus meant by the abundant life, unlike the health, wealth, and success folks. 
The abundant life is the love and the joy that comes through working with God abundantly. Yesterday's gone, tomorrow's not yet come. Live into the abundance of the Holy Trinity today.